So from around about the age of seven, I had a notion in my head that I would like to fly planes. As I got older and older, and the idea became firmer, uh, if you like, in my mind, I tended toward the concept that I wanted to fly fast jets. And that was reinforced when I was at school, speaking to a careers advisor. And when asked what I wanted to do when I left school, I said, I'd quite like to be a fighter pilot. At which point I remember him saying, well, have you got nothing serious that you'd actually like to do? And that cemented my idea that that's what I was going to set out to achieve. Flying a fighter is exhilarating. It does literally take your breath away. It's incredibly dynamic, high energy, hard work, physically as well as mentally. We could see above us, behind us, down below the aircraft to some extent because the canopy would be slightly wider than the fuselage. The only noise you hear, surprisingly, is the noise of the radios and people talking to you or shouting or breathing. Because, of course, when you're pulling G, you're also trying to um, tense your body against, you know, so you don't lose the blood to your feet. Okay, break left, break left, break left. There's one guy just to the right of your nose, slightly high. So we're often out of breath. You'd hear that, that noise on the radio, that chatter all the time. Okay, descend now, descend. You really didn't hear the, the engines. They were, all, they were behind you and they're, they're huge, powerful engines with afterburner and so on and so forth. Yep, got him. That was the sound of of combat, if you like. Okay, Fox 2, he's dead. Okay, let's go. Yeah, so um, I started my training in the Air Force at uh, RAF College Cranwell, which is in Lincolnshire. Um, it was a bit, I guess the analogy would be like being sent to boarding school for the first time. I was away from home um, under a very uh, rigid timetable, uh, strict rules and regulations, uh, which of course was all very important for part of the training. So for example, your beds were expected to be completely pristine every morning uh, when they were inspected. So we got into the habit of um, not sleeping in our beds. We would set them up and we would iron the sheets flat so they looked perfect and then would sleep on our sleeping bags on the floor just to save us time in the mornings. Most of my memories are fond, so it would be really hard to isolate a few to talk about you know, specific memories. But I have fond memories of all the training uh, that we did. Fond memories of the detachments, going abroad with effectively all of my friends on the squadron. In terms of friendship, overall friendship with everybody that I worked with, I will always have uh, fond memories of friendships. So can you tell me when, where and how you guys met? 1980, August 1986. August 86, yeah. Um, yeah, we both just First arrived. day, yeah. I'd been in the Air Force for five years by then. 
you were just joining and I was coming from... I'd been in the Air Force one day. <laughs> I was yeah. coming from the ranks into my upstream. So we basically went into that part of the Air Force yeah. together. And then we probably didn't see each other for maybe three years. But because you had formed such close friendships and in such sometimes extreme circumstances, circumstances yeah, yeah. then you pick up immediately uh, where you, where you um, drop off. And you do, sometimes you know what's I mean, When was the last time we just saw each other? Five years. Five ago. years. Is it really five years yeah. ago? I was wondering if you could tell me uh, exactly what happened to you during the first Gulf War. Uh, you know, I remember we were, we were JP, my pilot, John Peters, we were flying the jet, pushing the speed up near the target to maybe 600 miles an hour, something like that, at about 30 feet, I would say. As we fly in towards the target, everything's going well. You release the bombs, which are then tossed. So basically, you're throwing your bombs at the aircraft, and then you recover and fly. And in the middle of all of that, the bombs don't come off our aircraft. So JP is screaming at me, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? Uh, and there's suddenly, it's just a massive explosion. And it's like, it, it, we're hit by a heat-seeking missile. And I look out my rearview mirrors to the back, and the aircraft's gone. It's just a, a ball of flame, a, a ball of flame, like in that image behind me there. Um, you can see, all it is is flames, and the flames are marching steadily to where I sit. We were within a probably a second of hitting the ground, and we would have been killed then, no doubt about it. But he manages to get control of the aircraft, and we need to get out, so we eject. And you go from pulling the handle to all of that flames and confusion and fear and yelling and what's going on, suddenly there's a crack, and you're in a parachute. And then there's silence. You hit the ground, and then that's it. You're on the ground in enemy territory. We were on the run for about three hours trying to get to one of the search and rescue points. There was about, I don't know, 15, 20 Iraqi soldiers, airmen, shooting at us with AK-47 rifles. We both had personal weapons, guns, but there was nothing that we could do about it. So we kind of put our guns down, hands up, uh, <clears throat> and we were dragged off to Baghdad. We ended up basically in a, a military or secret police headquarters, being interrogated. We knew that we would give in to the interrogation. It was pretty brutal, beating, burning, kind of, you know, being punched, kicked, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, people stubbing cigarettes out on your ears and stuff like that. They were kind of kicking seven bells out of me and they stuffed tissue paper down my neck and set it on fire. Um, and you kind of knew that you would give in, but you didn't want to give in. Not because, just because you wanted to say that I, I, I didn't give in without some sort of uh, fight. After that, they started this uh, thing about, right, we want, you're going to go on TV, you're going to do a TV broadcast. And I really did not want to do that at all. That was really something that I railed against, but that didn't last long either. You are your age? 15 squadron. Uh, and so they basically kind of came down to a quite stark choice. They said, uh, you will do this TV broadcast or we will kill you. You kind of think, okay, I'm either going to die here or I'm going to have to give in. And I gave in. Thank you, sir. Do you have a message to be sent? From the dad, if you're listening, everything is okay here. Please pray for me. We should be home soon. I was on holiday um, with my girlfriend at the time and um, enjoying sunshine and sand. Uh, and a few drinks and so on. And then one morning, just walking to the beach or, or whatever we were doing, there was a, um, a news agent with a rack of newspapers outside and they all had the same photograph on the front page. And it was my mate battered around the head in his flying suit, um, you know, with a, with a headline about him being a prisoner of war. And it suddenly kind of dawned on me that this is it. We were in the Air Force, this is real. And that's my friend. And at the time, of course, I, I thought, probably like a lot of his uh, friends and relatives, that he wasn't going to come back alive from that. Having seen that photograph, it was going to go from bad to worse. About 48 days after it all started, a chap in a suit came into the concrete cell I was in and said, the war's over, you can go home. And we were handed over to the Red Cross. And we end up flying back to Cyprus for uh, three or four days for medical checks and psychiatric stuff as well, which we did not want. We didn't feel anything then. We, we felt the elation of freedom, the elation of survival. 
post-traumatic stress disorder was still, it was understood, but it was still very new, especially within the military. The classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, which are so easily recognisable now. Uh, guilt over survival, uh, flashbacks, um, things that bring back the experiences, things that you react to. But you know, certainly in the aftermath of that, I quickly recognised some of those symptoms. Uh, that still affects me now, nearly 30 years later. A bang, uh, a something like a firework going off, I was still jumped at. And they've been terrible, terrible. So really, you know, a lot of suicides, a lot of um, problems, and a lot of, uh, a lot of people deeply affected by their experiences. When I was operating in Bosnia, we were based in Italy at an Italian airbase. So we shared it with the Italians. Um, and when we'd finished our duty, so we're flying around at night, we came back, landed in Italy, and then went and stayed in a five-star hotel with a swimming pool and a bar. So it was quite strange. And then you'd get up the next day and go and do it again. Driving to work, we, we would all share a, a hire car between four of us. Um, and there'd be the talk in the car about, I wonder what the mission is going to be today. and what the plan is and where we might find ourselves and what had happened maybe to, to some of our friends the day before. The routine would be get airborne, we had to fly past a US Navy ship, which would um, point us out as being friendly amongst all the NATO forces. We fly past them, and then we would go and take fuel. And then after that air to air refueling was done, we would have a time to effectively cross a line. And it was a border, in our particular case, it was near the Croatian border. There were Muslims on the ground, uh, the majority of Bosnian Muslims, who were, were suffering effectively a genocide. And our job was to set up a no-fly zone to make sure that the, the, mainly the Serbs and some Croat forces, they didn't get either aircraft or helicopters airborne to bomb civilians in towns like uh, Sarajevo. Understanding that this was all going on below you, there's very little you could do because our job is to shoot down aircraft and if the aircraft weren't getting airborne, this was just artillery fire killing civilians. And every time one of those shells landed and you saw the explosion, you couldn't help but think somebody's losing their arm, their leg or their life. And this, when we were flying around Bosnia, the, because there wasn't any combat going on at the time, um, the radios were quite quiet as well. So a dark, a dark sky, a dark night, and then suddenly, and because the night vision goggles were so powerful, you see these arcs of fire, and then the explosion, all in complete silence, just watching this going on below. And that was quite a sense of detachment. The, the, the hardest thing was um, thinking about what was going on back with my family. No. You're so clever. Wave to Daddy. Say hello. Daddy. Daddy. Show Mummy where the pictures of Daddy are. You point to them. Where are they? <gasps> so they are. There's the photos of Daddy. One of the big reasons of my changing from military to civil aviation um, was uh, my kids growing up. Oh. It coincided with a time where um, I had, when I left the Air Force, I had two young children. Cameron, where do the airplanes fly? <laughs> yeah! If I had stayed in the Air Force, I would have had further promotion, moving from headquarter to headquarter every two or three years. And if I wanted my family with me, my kids would be moving school every two years, or we send them to boarding school, which I would never do. It was the right time to leave the Air Force and think about another career.